this is his first affair that he's been caught red handed. I need someone to take us serious because look what happened. What I saw in the woods in South Jackson is something you never want to see. Are you pretending to be crazy? No, I'm not pretending to be crazy. Yeah, I'm certified. Cool. I was only out of nut house two weeks now. We will hold these individuals accountable. We all know that the unfortunate reality is, is that we live in a world full of monsters. People we need to protect ourselves and our children from. If you're a regular viewer of this channel, or if you consume a lot of true crime content, then you know that each and every one of us needs to practice a certain level of caution to prevent ourselves from becoming the victims of crime. But sometimes it happens so suddenly without any warning that we are left with no way out. It's so tragic when this happens, but for people like Callie and her beautiful daughters, it doesn't seem like there was much they could have done to prevent this. And that is the scariest reality to face. This case is an exceptionally disturbing one. It's a very recent case that is very much ongoing, but I felt like I needed to speak on this because of how it all went down. It's truly heartbreaking and disturbing, but I wanted to share this story so we can remember these victims who suffered so severely. With that being said, let's get into the case. Callie Jo Brunette is originally from Laurentia, Louisiana. She attended Laurentia High School and was a part of the flag team. After graduating, she attended Hammond Technical School for Barbering and Medical Technology. She was from a proud family of farmers that goes back multiple generations. Callie was known as loving to be a country girl. She loved her hometown and going to Old Farmer's Day. But most of all, Callie loved being a mother to her two daughters, six-year-old Jaylee and four-year-old Erin. Erin Nicole Brunette was born on October 28, 2019 in Covington, Louisiana. Erin was described as being a little fireball, even at her young age. She could be a little bit spicy at times, always having a sassy comeback for anyone trying to tease her. But at the same time, she could also be so very sweet and loving. She had this little stuffed elephant, Ellie, who never left her side. She was absolutely full of life, starting to become her own little person. She had a very special bond with her big sister, Jaylee, and she always wanted to do everything she was doing. She really looked up to her big sister and mother. Overall, Callie, Erin, and Jaylee were a part of a family who were very close to one another and their extended family. They had deep roots in their small town of Laranger, and they were very proud of who they were. By the morning of Thursday, June 13th, 2024, Callie's mother, Debbie, became concerned after trying to contact her all morning and getting no response. She hadn't heard from Callie since that previous afternoon, which was a red flag. This was very out of character for Callie to just stop responding to her family members, so Debbie headed over to the home where Callie lived with her two daughters. However, when she got there, she was met with a horrifying scene. When she first pulled up, she saw that Callie's car, a 2012 Chrysler 200, was missing. Then, when Debbie made her way inside, she found Callie, who was lying dead in her bedroom within the home. It was clear that Callie had suffered from a brutal, vicious attack. According to later autopsy, Callie was murdered as a result of multiple sharp force injuries. She had been stabbed multiple times to her head, neck, chest, and back. Of course, this is just the most horrific discovery someone can make, especially when it's your own child. It's such a punch to the gut. It's got to be the literal worst feeling in the world. It's so traumatizing. After finding her daughter's body, she went around and searched for her granddaughters, Erin and Jaylee, only to realize that they were missing. Right away, Debbie contacted the authorities to report what she had just found. Immediately, an Amber Alert was issued for the two missing girls along with a description of the missing car. At this point, it's believed that someone entered the home, murdered Callie, and then kidnapped both of her young, vulnerable daughters. The first thing investigators did was run the license plates for the missing car. Pretty quickly, they found that the car had been traveling north in the direction of Jackson, Mississippi. Using that, they were able to find out that the car had been in Byram, Mississippi by 6.05 p.m. that previous evening, June 12th. Using that, police were able to obtain security footage from a McDonald's, which was located near where the license plate reader picked up that car. The footage was from the 12th, and on that footage, they saw the car, which was being driven by an unknown white man. 
At the time, the man was attempting to change the car's tire in that parking lot. Upon looking closer at the footage, investigators then spotted what looked like two small individuals sitting in the rear seats of that car while the man tried changing the tire. Right away, investigators just knew that these were the two missing little girls. As that was happening, still on June 12th, a woman named Dixie Hemphill started receiving messages from Callie's Facebook account. The messages told Dixie that it was actually her brother, Daniel Callahan. He said that he was using Callie's account to message her, saying that he did something bad and needed some gas money. He asked her to send some money over via Cash App, but she just had a bad feeling about the whole thing. She knew her brother well, so instead of giving her brother money, she notified the authorities of these messages. At this point, investigators started connecting the dots and figured out that Daniel Callahan may have been the one who murdered Callie and abducted her two daughters. They also realized that this case was now crossing multiple states, so police got the FBI and the United States Marshal Task Force involved in the investigation. By June 13th, just hours after the girls were reported missing, the U.S. Marshals started their searches in Byram, Mississippi, which was the last known location of Callie's car. Pretty quickly, actually, an undercover officer spotted Daniel Callahan walking along Terry Road in Jackson. It looked like he was going around and checking houses, according to that officer. Once he noticed the officer, he did try to flee, but the officer was able to catch up to him and managed to apprehend him. At that time, officers saw that the little girls were not with him. So, the desperate searches to find those girls continued. After apprehending Daniel, officers started searching down a nearby road, Boozier Drive. While on that road, they were approached by two civilians who said that they recently heard two children screaming from the woods about 50 yards behind a residence located on that same road. The Good Samaritans directed officers to that home where they zeroed in on their searches. The home appeared to be old and mostly unfinished with no permanent resident living inside. It appeared that a bunch of different people would use that home as a place to stay from time to time, but there was no one permanently living there. Once at the property, they searched all along the outside areas, and there, they found Aaron and Jaylee inside of a pit on that property. Of course, authorities were elated that they were able to quickly find these two girls. They had been holding their breath the entire time, hoping they would both be alive. But, unfortunately, that was not the case. Six-year-old little Jaylee was alive, but next to her was the body of four-year-old little Erin. She was unfortunately deceased. Also on that property, about 20 yards from the house, authorities did find Callie's missing car. Now, while investigators started to block off and process the scene, an adult male approached the officers to tell them that he had been at the house in the prior days. He said that he saw Daniel, Aaron, and Jaylee on the property and inside the home on both June 12th and June 13th. He doesn't know exactly what happened, but the girls did not appear to be happy to be there with this man. They clearly wanted to go home, and they clearly did not belong there with him. Now, after spotting Daniel on the road, he was arrested and taken into custody for questioning. Meanwhile, Jaylee was also removed from the scene and taken into the station for family to come pick her up. Of course, she was traumatized, and what we will soon find out about what she went through is completely heartbreaking. Once Daniel was taken into the station for questioning, he pretty much admitted to what he did right away. Daniel told officers that he stabbed Callie about 30 times in her home. He mentioned that he had wanted to kill Callie for quite some time, but as far as I've been able to see, he didn't mention why, so we still really don't have a reason for that yet. According to Daniel's sister, the two had dated about 13 years prior, but we really don't know why he would still have any sort of resentment or ill will against her, especially, again, because it seems like they hadn't been together in 13 years. In that interview, he continued that after stabbing and murdering Callie, he grabbed the two girls and put them in the car. He then drove himself and the girls over 100 miles to Mississippi, where he went to that house on Boozier Drive. When they got to the house, he said that Aaron and Jaylee were crying. They were very upset, saying that they didn't want to stay with Daniel. Eventually, Daniel realized that law enforcement were on the way and were searching for him, and it was then 
that he decided to kill Aaron. According to the Mississippi police chief, he believes that Aaron was suffocated to death. However, they are still awaiting the results of the autopsy, so they aren't 100% sure yet on how she died, but that's kind of what the assumption is at this point. Either way, no matter how you spin it, it's absolutely horrific. We're waiting on the forensic pathologist, the medical examiner. Uh, I would assume, and this is clearly an assumption, that she possibly died from asphyxiation or suffocation. Uh, but we would have to wait on the medical examiner before release that information. I did not see any gunshot wounds or anything like that, so it appeared possibly suffocation, but there's yet to be determined. Meanwhile, Daniel admitted that he decided not to kill six-year-old Jaylee because he wanted to keep her as a sex slave. Yup, you heard that right. He wanted to keep that six-year-old little girl around so he could molest her, which... This whole thing doesn't really make any sense to begin with, why he would kill the four-year-old because he knew police were on the way, but then he would keep the six-year-old around. That doesn't really make any sense. I'm not sure if I necessarily believe that's why four-year-old Aaron was killed. I think it might also have something to do with his sexual deviancy, but... Again, this is what we know as of right now. Also, as of right now, we know that although Jaylee was described as alive and unharmed when she was found, we still don't know all the details of her condition. It's very possible and probable, in my opinion, that she was harmed in some way, but obviously and thankfully, she survived. She was examined at the hospital after she was recovered, but the results of that examination have not yet been released. We can speculate about what probably happened to the two girls while with Daniel, but for right now, nothing is confirmed, especially about Jaylee's condition, so I'm not going to say what I think happened, but I do think more has happened than what we know. After that initial interview with Daniel, of course, he was arrested and charged with two counts of murder and sexual battery. As he was being taken into custody, he actually spoke with media where he admitted openly to what he did. He said, unfortunately, sober, on Lexapro, with no drugs in his system, he did kill Aaron. He said that he had no reason for doing what he did, but he said that he had borderline or multiple personality disorder. He kept talking about the Lexapro and his mental health. He also said that he's on suicide watch, though he's not suicidal. But then he said that he completely regrets what he did and that he deserves lethal injection. Mr. Callahan, do you have anything to say? I would like did to you kill Aaron like Burnett? Unfortunately, on Lexapro, sober, no drugs in my system, I did. Why? Why did you kill the, the three-year-old girl? I have no reason for what I did. All I know is I want to say I was sober and only on Lexapro and off Lexapro, and I'm also diagnosed borderline with a multiple personality disorder, and I have not got to talk to a lawyer, and I'm on suicide watch, but I'm not suicidal. But did you I kill, did you kill his, did you her mom? Did you kill her mom? Of the Lexapro. Did you kill her mom? His mom. Aaron's mom. I'm at Rankin County Jail if y'all would like an uh, interview. Do you regret what you did? Completely. You regret what you did? I would kill me and I'm gonna, I am, uh, I have told them everything that I did and I have agreed to not fight it. Speedy trial and the, uh, death chamber. Whatever it is, the. Did you hope for the death penalty? For what I did? Lethal injection is the easiest thing for me. Are you pretending to be crazy? No, I'm not pretending to be crazy. Look me up in Region 8. Borderline multiple personality disorder. You better look it up. So you, you have pretend no... to be crazy. Okay, yeah, I'm certified. Cool. I was only out of Nuthouse two weeks now. That right there was Daniel Callahan. As all of this was happening, with Daniel being booked into jail, him making all of these admissions, law enforcement continued to investigate the scene of where little Aaron was found dead. They announced that where this home was located was somewhere you would really only go if you knew the area. It's a dead end and kind of in the middle of nowhere, so it's not somewhere a person would just stumble upon. Knowing that, it's thought that Daniel knew the area and had been to this home on prior occasions. 
Then, within the home, authorities announced that they found signs of a possible human trafficking operation. They found small cages on the property as well as other wired enclosures. Based on that, they do believe that trafficking was going on there, but of course, there needs to be more investigation done. According to Daniel's sister, Daniel had been troubled his entire life and is a mastermind at crime. She said that she actually went to the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation a year prior to report that she believed he took part in the death of a missing man. She also said that he confessed to her to molesting a child. That case was taken to a grand jury at some point, but there wasn't enough evidence to actually get the charges to stick, so he was let go from that. I guess Daniel's father is a serial killer of some sort, and Daniel said to his sister multiple times that he wanted to be like his dad. He wanted to be a successful killer and wanted to write a book. But again, when Dixie reported this, it was not taken seriously. This is his first affair that he's been caught red handed. I would love to defend my brother, and I'd love to say it was the Lexapro. But it's not the Lexapro. He knows what he's doing. Hemfield says her brother has been troubled his entire life and is a mastermind at crime. She says that his actions against Brunette's family were horrific. She says her brother dated Brunette 13 years ago. I met her kids twice, you know. I just, I, that doesn't even matter. I feel so bad for her parents. Like, what? Why? Hemfield says she has gone to Mississippi Bureau of Investigation and the Lincoln County Sheriff's Department regarding her brother's behavior more than a year ago. She said Callahan once confessed to her that he molested a minor and he also took part in the death of a reported missing man. She said they did not take her seriously. I need someone to take us serious because look what happened. And y'all think in Lincoln County said there was no merit to him killing anyone. But yet they diagnosed him with seeing hallucinations and being schizophrenic and just let him walk up out of them doors. She said that Callahan had goals of pursuing a life like his father. He was classified as a serial killer. And we even try to tell MBI about this, that he wanted to be a prodigy of his dad and he was writing his own book, except he was going to succeed his dad. And he has. We spoke to the Lincoln County Sheriff regarding Callahan's criminal past. He says they did not ignore him Phil's warning. There was an allegation made against him on a sexual battery case. That case was investigated and presented to a Lincoln County grand jury. The grand jury did not indict him for any of those charges. He says there was just not enough evidence to indict Callahan on these allegations. How does you? How does it make you feel knowing that he like slipped through the cracks of the justice system earlier on? Well, ma'am, uh, of course it's a very sad situation dealing with these families and their loss. Um, uh, our, our society based on information that you can verify in order to convict somebody. Um, like I said, his earlier cases were presented to a grand jury of, of people of the county who did not feel like there was enough information to indict him on that earlier case. Now, after Daniel's arrest and finding that evidence at the scene which pointed towards a possible sex trafficking ring, police announced another arrest in the case. 31-year-old Victoria Cox has been identified as a co-conspirator of Daniel's, saying that she helped him kidnap the two sisters and bring them to Jackson. Because of this, she too has been arrested and is now charged with one count of capital murder, one count of kidnapping, and one count of sexual battery. As of the most recent article I have found on this case, Victoria remains in Jackson, Mississippi, while Daniel has been extradited back to Louisiana to face his charges. First against Daniel Wayne Callahan, the grand jury reported true bill indictments, two counts of first degree murder uh, for the murder of Callie Joe Brunette and the murder of Aaron Brunette, one count of aggravated kidnapping of a child and one count of second degree kidnapping. With respect to Victoria Cox, the grand jury returned true bill indictments of one count of first degree murder, one count of aggravated kidnapping of a child, one count of second degree kidnapping of a child, and one count of accessory after the fact to first degree murder. Daniel Callahan and Victoria Cox brought horror and unthinkable terror to, to the city of Jackson. These individuals were a threat to those kids, which means they were a threat to all of our children. What I saw in the woods in South Jackson is something you never want to see as a chief and as a father. 
we will hold these individuals accountable. As of right now, that is pretty much all of the information we have on this case. I know that it's a shorter one and a very recent case, but when I saw this case in the headlines, I felt compelled to speak on it. Obviously, this whole thing is so tragic and so, so very disturbing. Daniel is truly a very disturbed man who I think is going to plead insanity based on his current behaviors, but I guess we will have to wait and see. I'm also so curious to see if we learn more about Victoria's role in all of this. I haven't really been able to find too much detailed information on what exactly she did. This case truly serves as a reminder that we all need to be very, very careful of who we let into our lives. Again, we know that Daniel and Kelly apparently dated over a decade ago, but we still don't know why, 13 years later, he decided to do this. I wonder if they reconnected in some way or if he's just been watching her secretly all this time. I'm so, so curious to see what new information will come out because I know that what we do know is just scratching the surface of this case. I still have so many questions that I'm hoping we get answers to. I will be following this case as time goes on, so if there are any new updates as we move forward, I will let you all know. But as of right now, that is where I'm going to end today's video. Of course, my heart breaks for little Erin and her sister, who now has to live with this trauma that will follow her for the rest of her life. Not only was she abused, but she lost her little sister and her mother. I just hope that she's surrounded by family who love and support her and will help her navigate life after all of this. But after hearing all of the details, I want to know what you all think. Why do you think this happened? Do you think it had something to do with Callie and Daniel's past relationship? Or was she just an easy target for him to carry out his disgusting sexual desires on a child and to have people for this apparent human sex trafficking ring? Do you think he's going to plead insanity or just plead guilty or will he go some other route? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.